This podcast contains factual information only. It is intended for professional financial advisors and does not contain any personal financial advice. You should not make any investment, insurance or financial decisions based on the content of this podcast. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives. And we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. Futurity Investment Group is Australia's leading provider of education bonds and has over 45 years of expertise in tax and investments. The tax-effective trust-like structure of an education bond is a solution for all generations and provides unparalleled flexibility and access to deliver on-client goals, ranging from paying for education costs to family wealth transfers. This week's conversation is with Joe Brassett. Jo is the Director of Insurance Advisory Services. Not only does she run the team, she's the sole advisor within her business and she is a solo parent of a small child. So I wanted to know, has she got any balance? Uh, And surprisingly, the answer was yes. So then I was very keen to find out practically, how has she been able to set up her business and her personal life for success? Enjoy. Hello, Jo. Welcome. Hi, Jess. How are you? Good, good, good. I'm I am very excited by this chat. As I said to you when we were organizing this, um, I'm using this as an opportunity to reconnect with people that I used to know a million years ago and also uh, find out what is going on in your business and your life. And you've had so many changes. Mm -hmm. And I actually think from the little that I do know so far, you're pioneering what we all want as the dream. So no pressure, but today I'd love to sort of (laughs) learn more about what you do, how you've got there and what it's enabled from a life perspective, because it's great to have a lovely business. It's great to have happy clients, but ultimately if you're not looking after yourself and having a great life along the way, we probably need to ask ourselves why so. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I'm very excited. Tell me, Joe. for the people that don't know you, what is your story and your background? Okay. So, I – how far do you want to go? <laughs> oh, well, you, we can go where – I mean, you don't have to tell us about, you know, the birth or anything. You know, you can, you can start from wherever you like. Um, but, you know, people are often interested in how did you get to where you, you are and yeah. what are the, the big things that have influenced sort of the decisions that you've made along the way. Okay, so I never knew what I wanted to do when I left school. So Mm. I just kind of, I was always a bit arty and kind of did a bit of um, graphic design and visual merchandising and um, show card and ticket writing. And I did all these kind of things. And then my parents were always, you know, you should do some office management, um, you know, course and make sure that you kind of keep your kind of your skills up. And so I did that. They were always running a um, financial planning, which is ma- it was mainly insurance, um, both on the general and on the life side. So they have always run this business um, mm-hmm. ever since I was a kid. But I never grew up going, oh, yeah, I want to join the business. So mm-hmm. I kind of went off and did my own thing and um, kind of dabbled in different areas, but mainly all still around like marketing and advertising and being a PA and all those kind of things. And then I went overseas for six and a half years and worked in an investment bank mm-hmm. and traveled and did a lot of holidaying and finding myself and, you know, figuring out kind of what I like to do, what I'm good at, um, all those things. So I never, re- I never went to uni, um, but I mm-hmm. did a lot of courses. I've got a high learner. So I'm always learning things and taking on stuff and, so I did all that and then my sister was having a baby so I came back here um, to Australia and then worked in an investment bank over here which I didn't really enjoy and then said to mum and dad, I think I need to join the business. Like you need to show me what you do. It sounds really good. Um, I think I'm kind of ready to, to join up. 
So mm. I did that in 2008 and didn't really have any kind of ideas about what I wanted to, to kind of do within the business, but worked my way up from, you know, being a CSO and understanding how all that worked and then working with dad and, and just kind of, um, learning the tracks really and then doing all the mm. study, study at the same time. And so, yeah, so I started quite, I suppose, late and I didn't really kind of have any of those qualifications under my belt, but I did all of that. Mm -hmm. And then um, eventually became an advisor um, and just took over from my parents, uh, I think it was about three years ago now, and purchased the business. And now I'm paying them off <laughs> over time for the business. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, and so I have um, now I run a general and a life plus financial planning practice. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah, we, we're based in North Sydney um, as well as working from home. So that's kind of me Yay. in a nutshell. <laughs> It's an interesting one because obviously uh, there are a number of people who are in generational financial planning mm. businesses, but I think the ones that I know certainly it has always been their interest or aspiration to immediately step into the business when they were old enough and then start from there. So it's interesting that you went and had this whole other life really and this <laughs> whole other experience and no doubt that's helped you when you came back and thought, hmm, what will I do in this business differently? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And I think because I was a little bit older by that point, um, it did probably make a little bit more of a difference because I had that kind of experience. I'd been out, I'd figured out kind of, I'd done all my traveling or not finished, but you know, I, I did a lot of traveling and um, probably had my kind of university years overseas. So I kind mm. of got that out of my system. Um, and then by the time I came back, I just kind of the skill sets that I I don't know, I incorporated over the time and what I had naturally just kind of fit quite nicely. So it was good. And what does the business look like now in terms of staff and, you know, the types of people that you help, et cetera? Yeah, so we have um, five people in Sydney. So there's myself uh, mm -hmm. and a CSO and then I also have a um, practice manager and we also have two general staff members, so an account manager and an account executive. And then mm -hmm. we have five, then we have six, um, staff in the Philippines. So I have three support staff for the life side of the business and three support staff for the general side of the business. Okay. And as someone who also has a team offshore, mm -hmm. I'm fascinated to hear how has that helped your business and what challenges have you found from having that team offshore? Uh, okay. So. Because I did purchase the business from my parents, I'm still mm. paying them off, right? So when they were kind of moving out of the business, I was like, well, how am I going to continue to afford to pay for people who aren't actually going to be working in the business? So I had to figure out a way of being able to have staff but not have the overheads and the costs around all of that. So mm -hmm. it was it was definitely in my mind when Dad was still working with me. Um, mm -hmm. But we just – and we did try another company and it just didn't really work out. So mm -hmm. this was our second company. We're using Five Elk um, mm -hmm. and that was our second company that we did use and – I think I was listening to a podcast and they were talking about it. I was like, I just need to start this again and see if I can kind of get this going. We started mm. with one on the on the life side um, and then we just built up from there. So I believe that the key thing is to have um, great systems and have somebody who can really manage that person like they are in Sydney. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, Leah has been with me for like 12 years and so she knows how I work and we work really well together. Um, mm -hmm. And so getting her to really manage this person bit by bit and um, we've just grown kind of organically. So it hasn't been like that's just put in three people straight away. It's It's been virtually one a year kind of on, on either side and on the mm -hmm. general side, they didn't want to put in anybody. They were like, no, that's not how we work. You know, that's that's not going to work for us. And um, I said, look, if, if all they did was just do your filing, wouldn't that be helpful? And so mm. they were like, well, yeah. <laughs> I went, okay, so let's just start with that. So we just started with 
um, some things and then as they've progressed, they've just been able to hand over more and more and more and to the point now where we've got, you know, three on each side. I mean, that's definitely taken down the costs that I had and the overheads and the super and the workers, you know, all of those things that, Mm. You need to, and the space, um, mm. in, in Sydney, we've downgraded from where we were to a much smaller space. Mm-hmm. Um, and COVID actually helped with that. They actually, we were already in place with Five Elk and then they were like, well, we can answer your phones because we had to work from home. So I was like, well, how are we, how are we going to do that? How's that going to work for us? So they kind of said, well, we can step in and answer your phones when you're not there. So that took away the reception element, which also helped the staff. Like there's so many different bits and pieces that they do help with. Um, anything that we can delegate that is, you know, um, more administration-based, um, that's what we do now. So we use those skill sets. Mm. And if someone was thinking about, using that sort of model or system for the very first time, what what knowledge and pearls of wisdom would you impart on them to help them on their journey? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Let's have a think about that. Um, what would I think? It's, it's important to have the right company to help you um, to implement all of this. So really the the Daniels and the Danielle at Five Elk, um, they work really well as a team and um, they give us a real lot of support in when we bring on new staff members, when we're interviewing. They actually do a lot of the front-end training as well. So they already put them through like Iris and Advisor Logic and they have people over there who train um, for you. So mm. that takes a lot of the pressure off of that. They put them through a load of courses. We pay for them to do more courses if we can. So the more um, information that they can get, the better. Um, we also ask them to, and it's unusual um, the way that we do things, I think, um, because Danielle's told me. <laughs> it, you know, usually they just give them uh, you just give your staff members something that they do and they generally just do the same thing every day, but we, we give them everything. So, you know, I, I'm always asking them to think and, um, you know, think ahead of me. Uh, we talk on teams all the time. So, you know, we're, it's like they are in the office and I, we really work with a strengths based kind of culture. So whatever they're really good at, then we really try to, um, bring that on board so that, you know, we can get the best out of people, but also mm. cross, crossing over in case, you know, you know, somebody is off going to have a baby and then you've got somebody else who needs to step in. You don't want to ever be in a situation where you haven't got support. Um, yeah. Yeah. It is interesting because we were told that we were giving our team too broad a role mm. and to actually narrow it down so that they are doing sort of the same or similar thing and that repetition was important. But it sounds like actually if you've got the systems in place, uh, which I'm sure you do because I know that you're an organized human, um, <laughs> and you sort of empower them to go and learn more and, and have the space, I guess, to go and investigate before they come and see you, they actually can do a breadth of different things for you over time. Yeah, look, I think that also comes in time. It also comes with a lot of feedback and delegation and checking and, you know, all of those kind of things that you you always need to do with any staff member. I'm always one when I'm training, I give the information on why I'm doing what I'm doing with any mm. staff member. So the reason I'm doing this is because A, B and Z, so that they mm. get a bit more of a picture on kind of where they fit within the the project or, or the task. So um you are right though. I mean, I am highly organized and very consistent. And so, you know, I tend to, we do the same thing all the time and they do have processes and procedures to follow at all stages, but it can't just be a robot. You know, you can't just have somebody who just follows the process of the bouncing ball because it just doesn't, it's not real life. And so for me to be able to give them the opportunity to draft an email first understand why I've done it um, and how I've uh, how I've pitched it and why I've pitched it then even when they're doing that the next time they understand 
why and then they try to put together the email for me and then I then check it and go, okay, it needs tweaking. And then by the end of it, then that's a process because they've kind of figured out that that's a process or they know by the amount of times I'm asking the same questions, Joe's going to want to know this, so I will just go back and update her. So I'm I'm really a big one on making sure that they communicate when they've done something as well so that I know it's out of my head, it's out of my head and into into your head and that you're confirming back that it's been completed. So, you know, there's a lot of systems around that as well and communication. Mm. Communication is really key. Mm. And you use Teams predominantly to do that. Uh, teams, yeah, we use Teams. Uh, we have Advisor Logic, so we have tasks, um, and we have um, processes and procedures for all of the renewals that we send out, um, the Calendly invitations, you know, calling up clients, the SMSs, like everything. It's it's very highly organised um, to a point where you know they just follow the procedures, and then if it diverts from that, then they know that they either have to let me know or then they try to think about it and kind of come up with a solution and then come and tell me and then we work on it together. And this is interesting because you have a big team for one advisor. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like you are the sole on on the life and the financial advice piece. Yeah. You are the sole advisor and I guess you've built a big team so that you can – get everything done that needs to be done in a profitable way that doesn't chew up all your time? Has that been sort of why you've built the team to be the way it is? Yeah, because I I do have a lot of energy. My, one of my top strengths is, um, you know, achiever. So I like to achieve a lot and I have, you know, we use um, Notion and we use tasks in Notion. Like I've got everything kind of already organized. So I do a lot within a day. And so if I feel that, and I do generate quite a lot. So we, when I took over the business from mum and dad, like we had a lot of clients already over the last 45 years. So mm. then I took over there and so then I we don't lose a lot of clients. So I'm mm. continually building, but at the same time, you know, I'm making sure that I'm servicing the ones that we've got and then looking after the new ones that are coming in. So it has to be more of that. And a a lot of that is around the administration. I mean, looking after clients and and making sure they've got all the information and being communicative and sending out newsletters and all those kind of things, it makes the clients feel like they're the only client, but actually there's a whole team around to make sure that they feel like that. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's important that, yeah, I don't want to ever feel like somebody is not feeling like they're getting their money's worth. So... I suppose it does need a big support team to ensure that that happens. And then if I feel like we are at that tipping point, which we were last year, um, where the staff over there were kind of making a few more mistakes, they weren't getting stuff done, I'm like, I think we're at that tipping point where we need to bring in another staff member because we are growing and I feel like we need to bring in somebody else. And so I'm always thinking ahead to the next stage and – bringing on new staff members as I feel like is is necessary. And now we're at a situation where everybody is really humming really well, like they're thinking ahead of me and they're not making as many mistakes and it's all looking good and we're on top of things and, you know, we can do maybe extra little projects to check things because we've got more time and more staff now. So, yeah. Oh, that sounds like a nice place to be in. (laughs) (laughs) Very exciting. But you're right, you know, you are the face of the business and you are the – the support from a client interaction perspective, but to effectively do that, you have, you need to have so much infrastructure, whether it's systems and tech and people and all of them sort of helping you have that time to be able to keep great relationships and bring on new ones. And it's interesting because I don't know very many advisors that have a team of your size for one advisor. And I think that it proves that this type of business model can work. Whereas what I've seen happen a lot in the past is people bring on more advisors and they normally have, you know, one advisor and maybe one power planner or one CSO. Mm. Um, Actually, you've gone down quite a different route. It does leave you in a, there's risk, which we can't sort of ignore, (laughs) so we should chat through that. But I I think that business model is unusual and Mm. yet seems to be highly successful in your world. Yeah, it is unusual and there is risk um, for sure. 
and I I feel like probably in maybe the next financial year um, I'll need to make a decision on whether I want to bring in an advisor, mm. another advisor, or whether I want to bring in another CSO. So I don't know. I mean, I hope the whole thing about when you – when you bring in another advisor is making sure that everybody is, is doing things the right way. You know, I'm, I'm checking my own compliance. I've got a compliance lady who checks my compliance. You know, all of that I know because I'm the one providing the advice. But once you start handing that out to others, you just need to make sure you've got checks on that. And I still don't feel like I am completely set up in a way that I would feel comfortable bringing in another advisor just yet. Um, I am setting that up. I've got a stute wheel that I've bought on and I'm doing more kind of templated things along that path. So I think that perhaps once I've done that and I feel like I'm at that point, I would bring in another advisor and get them to work with me. Um, but then you've got to find the right one. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, uh, yeah, it's a challenge to try and partner up with somebody um, works the same yeah. way and thinks the same way that you do. Yeah, from a pool that is sadly shrinking or you mm-hmm. go down a route where you bring in someone that is completely new to do the professional year and that has a whole gamut of other mm. considerations and opportunities, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, mm. exactly, right? So, And it's not easy to find staff on the general side or on the life side. So, you know, and if you do, then it's going to cost you a lot. So I'm, I'm yeah. probably thinking a little bit more outside of the box to see if I can make it work in a different way because I'm not sure I have the funds at the moment to be able to warrant bringing in somebody of that kind of caliber. Mm. It's a constant dilemma that I know many advisors or business owners are grappling with. Um, Since you've been starting this conversation, you've been talking about a lot of tech throughout this conversation. So let's just do a bit of a recap in terms of what tech you're using for what, if that's okay. So Mm -hmm. it sounds like your financial planning software is advisor logic. It's be, it's become, yes. So we've got uh, the CRM, which is um, advisor logic. And then we have Calendly, which I send out to all my clients to book in. So clients, BDMs, anybody who wants to book in with me goes in the Calendly and that's all color coded. (laughs) So it's pretty full on. Um, if anybody saw my diary, they'd probably like have a bit of a, a meltdown. But anyway, it makes me feel like it's my happy place. Uh, cool. And then I um, I have Feedsy, which is um, a newsletter that goes out that I use and I put – I outsource my articles. I, do a, I have a copywriter and a marketing lady. So each month we do an article and then that mm. gets put on top of the Feedsy newsletter. And the Feedsy okay. newsletter goes out each month, and that's to okay. the life and the um, the financial planning clients. We actually also have a general business insurance newsletter that goes out, and that's facilitated mm-hmm. by CGU. That goes out once a month, and then we have an mm-hmm. investment one for all the investment clients just to give them a bit of an investment update. But all of that is facilitated through Feedsy. Mm-hmm. Um, we, what else do we have? We have Iris. I do a little bit of Iris, mm-hmm. which I use. You mentioned Notion before. What's Notion? Notion. Notion is a, it's a free package that you can put. It's a bit like, um, it's a sales. Cause you know, when you have, um, when you have projects and when you have, um, tasks for clients in Advisor Logic, it's all about like the clients and what they're doing. But we also have a company that we run and yeah. there's a lot of, um, meetings and budgets and targets and, you know, sales and all of those kind of things that there's no real place for that mm. information. So that mm. all goes in Notion and Notion is where we have, um, we note all of our quarterly meetings, we have weekly meetings, we do all of our updates in there. So the sales, um, I basically use that as my sales force type of environment where I, and anything that comes into my mind or anyone that books in, it just keeps notes in there and then we translate that we just copy that and put that into um, advisor logic if they become a client and, you know, they need a task or anything. But that's kind of how I keep track of it. Interesting. Yeah. 
And then you're using the astute wheel in client meetings, is that right? I'm only just starting to implement astute wheel. So before, okay. like I'm kind of doing more things um, in Excel and more kind of manual, which I feel could be as I'm getting busier and busier, I want to do it more online and I want to be mm. able to do it so that it's more in real time. So mm. I'm, so I've got a project with my CSO where we're implementing a shoot wheel. Um, and hopefully by the end of this financial year, we'll be ready to start using that and implement the processes moving forward on a shoot wheel. And that should then ensure that kind of the strategies are all set up the same. You know, we can print off SOAs if we need to, you know, so I'm looking at that next step to, um, make sure that our processes are, are clean, clear, uh, real time, you know, it's quicker, those kind of things. So we're not using a shoot wheel yet, but we will be. Okay. Hmm. Um, one thing that we haven't touched on because we've been talking a lot about the business is um, you're a human and have a life and um, you, I think, have a really interesting mix. So uh, unless there's anything really specific that we haven't asked about from the business perspective yet, which I'm happy to, hmm. I want to talk about how you run the team, mm -hmm. run projects, see clients, you're a solo parent. Mm-hmm. And you work a four-day week. <laughs> Joe, how? Tell us. For the people who are idiots who can't work out how to do this and are working stupid hours, can we talk about your do you have what we would consider to be balance? Uh, I feel like I have balance. So when Miles was born, I obviously took time off to, to have him and – I ended up at some stage going back three days and then four days and I never made it back for the fifth day because he was going, he was like still off. I wanted to spend time with him before he went to school. Um, and dad and I, when we were running the business, we always said, look, I'm not really into making massive profits. I want to have a lifestyle business where we can enjoy what we're doing and not be stressed out to the max, just trying to, you know, earn all this money. So that's kind of still really stuck with me. And also I must say that my sister is my business coach and she really does help me in ensuring that I'm looking at that, um, putting things in place, that I'm sticking to the plans, you know. So that really does help. And, and um, so I must say she's a really good one to kind of help me make sure that I am balanced. Um, mm. I outsource everything. So we're like the coaching, the cleaner, the personal training, you know, like the power planners, the copywriters, the, you know, the parents pick up miles. Like I, I outsource a lot of things so that I'm concentrating on the things that I really need to concentrate on. And mm -hmm. I think that probably why I have that massive team is so that I don't get bogged down into doing all of the admin and doing all of the other bits and pieces and the compliance and, you know, all those things that so easily can distract you from what you're doing. I'm still across mm. it and I'm still on top of it because we have mm. our weekly meetings, but I'm not running those things. But um, on like my mental health, the way that I keep that together is I work two days at home and I work two days in the office. Mm -hmm. Um COVID has really helped because before I was going out and I was seeing a lot of people and traveling and, you know, that, that time to go out the way that my dad used to do it and the way that I was mm. taught mm. really changed um, to mainly being online now. So a lot of people just book online, they prefer it, and Great. it just like, means that I can see four or five people a day now rather than just maybe one or two. And it does make a big difference um, to how many people you can service. But, you know, I, I do the gym on a on a Friday and I do spin religiously and a spa and a sauna. <laughs> and then I go and I still do all my work on my phone and I delegate and, I'm, you know, the staff are happy I'm not in on a Friday because I'm not generating more client work. But I'm already mm -hmm. delegating stuff before I go on a Thursday and making sure that they're doing things and teams are, are pinging left right and center but I'm still you know doing my shopping or, or whatever I'm doing I'm just managing more on a Friday rather than actually being physically in the office or I don't have any client appointments on a Friday and mm -hmm. I don't have any client appointments on a Monday so Mondays are for like doing 
you know, internal meetings, um, you know, BDMs, you know, stuff like that, stuff that I need to like sort out for the week and clients are Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So that's kind of how I coordinate the time so that I make sure that I get everything done. Amazing. And we need to um, normalize outsourcing as much as humanly possible. Mm. And, you know, your story is an interesting one because, I mean, you were pretty much the succession, like the known succession plan when you decided you were going to have a baby. Was that really scary, the thought of stepping up and taking on a big responsibility like running the business, running the team, taking on the debt? And having a child by yourself? Um, I well, I never really thought about having um, a child by myself until Mum was like, "Well, we'll help you, so it's no problem." And and you know, I was thinking, "Well, do I want to meet a man, or do I want to have a baby?" I think I want to have a baby first, and then I'll meet mm. the man later. So mm. um, I never felt I was doing it myself. So there was always um, the family who were going to help me with that. So and that's been the same all the way through. Um, yeah. When I had Miles, Dad was still in the business. Um, we still had him working in there. So it never really kind of occurred to me that I was taking it all on without him there at that point. So, and then when he was there, I was kind of running it anyway. So I don't know. I just kind of felt like it was just an, another piece of paper that I was just going to take over, but it was the same. It's going to be exactly the same as what I was doing, just. I was going to own it and they were going to work for me or whatever. So, you know, it was just I didn't really think about it in that way. Um, I suppose if I did, I might have freaked myself out a bit, but, you know, I don't kind of think about things like that. I kind of just I'm pretty half cup full type of person and just I know I can always get stuff done and I have a lot of energy. So, you know, I didn't really kind of think about it in any other way. Mm, I think that's very um – helpful because I think you can get into this spiral where you overanalyze everything and you particularly in our, like in our world where we naturally try to plan things because that's mm. literally our mm. job and it can mean that we find ourselves in a in a situation where we talk ourselves out of doing something like taking on that bigger job or taking on that additional responsibility stepping up um, or starting a family or making a big life change where whether it be move somewhere or do something different um, because we get into this sort of analysis spiral so yeah and I guess the big difference for you Joe, is because you've had the control now and the infrastructure you've been able to do it in a way where you know like you have not only the Friday off but like you build in time throughout the year to make sure that you get breaks as well right yeah so I make sure that um you know, I really noticed with COVID when we weren't going away for holidays, I really noticed that I wasn't recuperating as well as I used to. Um, yeah. There's a lot of brain energy, you know, expended in running a business and doing strategies and thinking about clients all the time. You know, you're you're constantly making sure that everybody else is okay. So, mm. you know, especially when, you know, I've got Miles and I've got mum and dad who are aging and so there's a lot of stuff going on all the time. So it really is important to take time out to make sure that you're getting your acupuncture, you're doing your holidays, you're doing your detoxes, you're doing all those things. And so for me, I, I really make sure that I take six weeks off at Christmas time. So we, I have the whole of January off. Um, and, you know, partway through December, like we generally work the last week. Um, and then, yeah, throughout the year, I, I make sure that I have some time off in July and then some time off in August. You know, I, I really build in those, um, processes so that we made some months quite a bit smaller than others to ensure that I had some time to rest and recuperate and the same with the staff like they're always like there's no there's no slow months joe <laughs> I'm like we just do it in the slow months and they're like there's no slow months I'm like, <laughs> oh, surely there's got to be a slow month sometime but there's mm. not mm. yeah so um yeah i say things like this i'm like when we're quiet <laughs> and then everyone giggles because it's just not a quiet thing but um i've really grappled with this and i think this is something that i have done quite poorly because i think we have normalized busy and i think we mm. have made rest seem wasteful 
um, which is BS from all of the research that I am learning about, um, which is why I'm enjoying this podcast because it's really nice to hear people who are doing it and, and living it and breathing it. And would you say that that rest makes you come back as a better leader, as a better advisor? Like what's the, apart from having a lovely time and and um, enjoying sort of pina coladas or whatever it is that you're doing, but what does it actually bring to the business by having that time off? Oh, look, I think even with the four days, you know, being able to have that Friday where, you know, I'm not thinking about client strategy or not thinking about the staff per se. I'm still managing, but I'm not like full on in it. It just gives me a three day weekend every weekend. And so that just revised me as it is, you know, just being able to do that and then come back and, um, you know, just manage, not take, not be stressed. Like I don't feel stressed. Like I don't feel like I take on stress. I really, do manage that quite well um, and I feel that comes down to the staff as well. Like they feel less stressed. When when Dad was running things, it, it had to be busy. It had to be busy and you had to be stressed because if you weren't stressed and busy, you weren't doing a good job. You weren't making money and you weren't getting clients in and it was all stressful because it wasn't stressful enough. And I just don't want to live like that. And was that because that was like – the old school way of doing things like we just need to be more better more with less yeah. sort of mentality yeah and you know just if you if you're not busy in the word busy all the time you know mm. it's it's you're not doing a good job whereas being actually organized and in a way where everybody is doing what they're meant to do means that everybody is enjoying what they're doing and it means that can you hear my dish my can you hear my dishwasher? It's actually singing to me. It's finished. You're, out, you're outsourcing your washing up. That's brilliant. <laughs> and it sings to you. This is get appliance and put sing as well. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I mean I do I just feel like you don't need to be that stressful, busy to you know, be doing a good job. It just doesn't need to. I think that's an old way of thinking of things. And it does feel weird though. When you first start to do it, you feel like, oh, I'm not doing enough. Like I should be busier. Like it feels weird. Oh, did you have like guilt almost? Tell me about what that was like. It was just this thing where I was, I was sitting there and I was talking to Kath and I'm like, um, I feel like I should be doing something. Like I feel like I should be busier. Like when dad was here, it was always like much busier. But the figures were still, they were doing really well and I was still doing what I wanted to do and I was still able to take the day and it just, there was this kind of just this realisation that, oh, maybe I don't need to work that hard, maybe just needs to be smarter to be able to achieve what I want to achieve. Um, and I still get peaks of that now. Like I'm like, oh, I don't know, I still maybe I should go back. And then I think, well, I've got to do some studies and maybe I'll keep the Friday because then I could do some study. And, you know, I still do have like little tweaks of that, but not enough to maybe want to go back <laughs> to mm. go back to the five days. I think that's so interesting in terms of like having to learn mm. how to be okay with not being stressed all the time or racing all the time because it would be weird. It would be really weird to have to try to unlearn and give yourself the psychological safety to be like, no, actually, we're still doing well. We're just doing it differently. And we've got presumably it's, you know, we've got more infrastructure and we've got bigger teams and we've, you know, I know, I know you and I know that you're very organized. So I can mm -hmm. imagine that, you know, everything is apart from the fact that we're human, but I would imagine quite a well-oiled machine over there. I think it's really aspirational, Joe. Like there's so many of us who are hoping and wanting to get to that point. <laughs> um, for people who aren't as naturally organized as you with your beautiful <laughs> color coordinated calendars. <laughs> so outsourcing has been crucial. What are the other sort of tips that you would give to people who want to transition to this style of lifestyle that you have? Get a good coach. <laughs> Kath, mm. Kath has been amazing. This strengths-based mm. coaching has been incredible. When Dad stepped out, he was my sounding board. And so, you know, I had no one then to talk to about the running of the business and how that was going to be and the staff and all those kind of things and money. And, you know, I think that when you're a solo business operator, you do need that person. Like I have an accountant, um, 
But he doesn't step in to provide me with the information that I need for me to be able to run the business and the staff and all those kind of things. So, you know, I think having that and I, as I said, I'm very consistent. So I made sure that we met on a, on a weekly basis and that I gave myself tasks to do on that weekly basis. So mm. that was highly important to start with. So I did that with Catherine right at the very beginning, just the two of us for a long time. And then when I felt like I was ready, I brought in like a, a, my two leadership team people and then we sit down now on a weekly basis and everybody has their own tasks and we update and we talk and, you know, that keeps us because we were all pinging emails to each other all the time. And so then it was like you're disturbing everybody who's working because you can't not get it out of your mind. So it's like, mm. well, let's all bring it to a meeting and discuss it at a meeting. Mm. And then that's that's the moment where we discuss all things compliance or all things staff or all things, you know, budgetary. Let's do it there and that way we can leave the rest of the week to work on client stuff and, you know, things that we need to work on. So it is really being able to put things into their little pockets to make sure that you're discussing things at certain times, you know, clients Tuesday to Thursday, day off Friday, you know, internal things on a Monday, BDMs. I only see them on a Monday. Great. Not when they not when they want to come and see me. I'm like, mm. this is the day that I can see you. Here's my calendar. You can book in when I'm free. So then they come and see me when I'm able to do it. Yeah. So I think it's just making sure that, you know, you need to, I don't know, I don't know how to teach anybody to be organized. Oh. <laughs> I don't know how I don't know how to impart that knowledge. Um And it's not even the knowing, it's the doing. Mm. Knowing yeah. and doing are so different. <laughs> right, mm. yeah. And, you know, I think with um, with Teresa on the, the general side, it's taken a lot for her to think about this in a different way as well. Like it's probably taken a good two years for me to get the team to think the same way or similar way than what the, the way that I do and mm-hmm. how to get them to delegate. Like I've got great people who always want to do everything. And I'm like, that's fantastic, but... We're never going to grow. We're never going to do anything if we're all doing it ourselves. If we keep it and we're not willing to share it or train or to get others to help us, you're going to be stuck in the same position. Mm. So, you know, and I feel maybe a little bit of that is because we've outsourced, we've had a little bit more funds to be able to spend on marketing and other areas where I was probably trying to do it all myself before and it's just not feasible. Or fun. Not fun, yeah. Mm. It's not fun. Not fun. I don't know many people that have achieved it, and I mean it as in balance. I thought it was elusive, this sort of utopian destination that doesn't actually um, exist whilst you have small children. Mm. And so to be able to have a lifestyle where you're not missing these years that don't, you know, come back, they're only little ones. And we were talking about, you know, it's mm. such a nice age when they're little and, um, still think you're cool (laughs) in a few years and then they won't want to see you. Um, Exactly. I think it's an an enormous achievement and a huge congrats to you because, yeah, I am looking at you and and have known you for a long time but have watched from the outside and and wondered if it could be done and you've helped me see that it can be done. (laughs) Giant congrats. Um, Anything else that we haven't talked about before I do some rapid-fire questions that you think the XY community would want to learn about your journey or your business or anything really? I suppose um, just with being able to kind of do it all, I think that's where really Calendly made like a massive difference. I was being dictated, I suppose, my times um, by when I was calling up clients and trying to get them in the diary and so – you know, that whole process of being able to send out invitations and, and I still love like being out on a Friday, like walking around and having invitations just dropping into my diary. Like that's the best thing ever, right? Mm. So before it was always trying to cajole clients to come in and see me mm. and now it's like they're willing to to kind of come in and do it themselves. And so you can block off time. So if Miles has got a cross-country run next Wednesday morning, I can cross that out of my diary and so then I make sure that I'm there. So it really is making sure that you're putting timings around your work life rather than the opposite way. And clients will always find another time. 
if they yeah. can't make that one. And if there's nothing in the diary, then they call me and then we make a, an exception to the rule. But yeah. obviously, like, you know, they will always find a different time to come in and sort something out if they really want to. So, yeah, and the support. I, I wouldn't be able to do any of it without my family, honestly. Like, mum and dad pick up miles all the time. Like, they really we'll do help the village. Me. It takes a village. It, it? it really does take a village. <laughs> and that's okay. And that is okay. Yeah. Um, wonderful. I am very impressed. I wish I'd have learned that piece around the Calendly uh, five years ago because I had a similar thing, but I was, and I guess, you know, the traps of a new business, you know, I was doing my first meeting of the day at 7 a.m. I would offer meetings until 8 p.m. I worked right. six days for client meetings and then I'd spend the seventh day trying to get scramble and um, get groceries and complete whatever paperwork I needed to get done for the week. And it it was awful and yeah. it was so hard for me psychologically to put boundaries in place and then when I did, no one cared. <laughs> no one cared. Honestly, no one cared. Like people, people were like, oh, I can't do 7 a.m. anymore. Fair. You know, you yeah. got to have a life. I was like, oh, my gosh, how did it take me to get to the brink of my existence <laughs> before I, I know, became right? okay with- We've got to give ourselves permission to at least try this stuff and then if it doesn't work, go from there. So, Well, that's the thing, right? I think you've got to at least try and then if that doesn't work, you try something different, you know, but real growth comes from change and just trying something different. It's, it's scary but sometimes it's great, you know. You never know what you're going to get at the end of it. Totally, totally. Hey, I've loved our chat today. Can we do a couple of random questions? But before we get there, if people want to learn more about you or chat with you, how can people best connect? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn and Mm -hmm. I'm also got my email. It's a long one, jbrassett at insuranceadvisoryservice.com.au. I've also got my website. Um, Yeah, I'm all over the place. So you can always try and find me. Wonderful. Okay, let's fire off my last couple of questions and then I will let you get back to your very structured day. Uh, Mm -hmm. What is one thing that you do to look after your mental health? One thing I do to look after my mental health, I take the Friday. Mm. What is a piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? Uh, HSC isn't everything. Learn, um, look at your strengths and figure out what you're good at and then you'll find a job that will fit in with that. So true. Uh, Do you have something that's quite big and exciting on your bucket list that you haven't ticked off yet? Well, I was supposed to go to Croatia when COVID hit, so I would like to go back there at some point. Mm. Um, I think that would be lovely. Last question. Do you have a book for me to put on my list for my fake book club? <laughs> for your, did you say your fake book club? I mean, it's a book club that I am part of, um, so I don't think that that counts as a real one, but I like to hear from <laughs> book. Okay, so I've got um, Apples Never Fall by Leanne Moriarty. You can't see, but she's actually got the cover of the book. Okay. Yeah, I've got the book Apples here. Apples Never Fall. So Apples Never Fall, and that was from my real book club <laughs> that, that I'm in. Excuse me. You will not offend my book, my fake book club, <laughs> Apples Never Fall. Brilliant. <laughs> Amazing. Joe. It's been so lovely to chat to you. Congratulations on both your business and personal success. And I wish you all the very best for this wonderful balance life that you have into the future. Thank you for being part of today. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. It's been good to catch up. Mm-hmm.